We will be looking in Matthew chapter 5 tonight. And uh, my mic is on. Yes, okay, good. Yeah, we'll be in uh, Matthew chapter 5 uh, this evening, continuing on in a series through Matthew. Uh, this will be the ninth message, if anyone's keeping track. <laughs> Anthony nods. Yeah, I am keeping track. Um, before we uh, uh, get into the message, let's uh, ask the Lord for his help. Lord God, we are grateful for um, this Lord's Day. We are grateful for your word, and we pray that you would be at work by your spirit in our hearts, that we would um, hear and understand uh, the word, that we would apply it as we can uh, in our lives, and that you would use it to make us more like Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. This is the uh, chapter 5 in Matthew, is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And as we have seen in uh, past uh, messages, uh, Jesus begins with the Beatitudes, where he defines who uh, the kingdom of heaven is for and the persecution that uh, these people should expect. And even though we are being persecuted, we should still be salt and light in the world, acknowledging that uh, persecution is going to come, but that's no excuse. We need to still be standing for the truth of the gospel in the world. And uh, that brings us to uh, tonight's message, where Jesus is speaking about fulfilling the law and what that means and, and how that plays out in the kingdom of heaven. And so let us... Um, let us read the passage. Matthew 5, verses uh, 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He begins saying, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of or the prophets. Who says he wants to abolish the law and the prophets? Where, where is this coming from? Well, remember that Jesus, uh, up to this point, has already been going around and preaching and teaching all over. And all of the people have been coming. He's been performing miracles and healing. And so the people have heard his message. And so have the scribes and the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, the established religious order, and they're not happy about Jesus. This guy who is a nobody came out of nowhere, out of this little town, Nazareth, um, speaking like a Galilean with his Galilean accent, and uh, this uneducated guy, and yet all of the people are flocking to him to hear what he is saying. And Jesus, as we're going to see today, Jesus is getting at the heart of the law, what the law really is, not what the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees have been teaching. And so they are definitely against what Jesus is uh, teaching. And so part of what he is doing here in, in this Sermon on the Mount is saying, hey, you may have heard that I'm about abolishing the law, that I'm setting it aside, that I'm interpreting it wrongly, that I think we shouldn't keep it. No, that's all slander. That's what the established religious uh, groups want to say about me, but that is false. I am for the law. In fact, he says, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And 
all of his teaching, as we're going to see, not, not just today, but in um, chapters to come, he's talking about the heart of the law, how the heart is where the law interacts with us, right? It's not just outward things that we do, as was the, t- the teaching of the Pharisees. If you can outwardly, externally, uh, not commit adultery, for example, then you're keeping the law. But that's not what Jesus has been teaching. Jesus has been teaching that if you lust in your heart, that's committing adultery. And so uh, that's, that's where we're going here. And so in verse um, 18, he says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And uh, the focus and purpose of what Jesus is uh, saying here is that I am not only here to teach the law, but to honor it and lift it up. Everything in the law is valuable, and I'm not abolishing any of it. The littlest dot in the law is valuable. So how does Christ fulfill the law and the prophets? How does he do that? Uh, By the way, the law and the prophets, that is what they called, you know, the Old Testament, their scriptures. They just called it the law and the prophets. The law were the books of Moses. The prophets were, of course, the prophets, but they included, by saying law and the prophets, all of it. You know, that's, that's the Old Testament. That's what they called the scriptures, the law and the prophets. Okay, so how does Christ fulfill it? Well, there's, there's three big ways. And the first is that he was the spotless lamb, okay? In Romans 8, 3 and 4, it says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And we could go to all kinds of verses that talk about how Christ fulfilled in, in the sense of keeping all of the law. He was sinless. He was blameless. He was perfect. And he had to be in order to be the spotless, spotless lamb and uh, a worthy sacrifice to cover the sins of the people. Okay, And so that is the, one of the ways that he fulfills the law, by keeping it, by never having broken any of the laws himself, but having kept them perfectly, not only externally, but also internally in the heart. A second way that Christ fulfills the law and the prophets is through prophecy, a lot of the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, all the prophecies concerning Christ, he fulfills those scriptures. In Luke 24, um, he says, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And you'll remember Jesus walking with the men out uh, of Jerusalem where he was, you know, they didn't know it was him, and he was telling them all about how all of the things in the scriptures pertain to him. And Christ came to fulfill all of those prophecies, and he did. And there are yet more to come with his second coming and so forth, right? Right? and the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus is the one who was fulfilling all of the law and the prophets uh, as he uh, accomplishes that which was prophesied. And a third way is ceremonial worship. We think about all of the uh, laws surrounding holiness and purity and being set apart from the rest of the world. The Um, sacrifices in the temple, the Passover, and all of these things all point to Christ. All of that. And in Hebrews 9, uh, it says, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons and the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself 
without blemish to God. Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And there are um, many passages uh, in Hebrews specifically that talk about how the ceremonial law, all of the um, sacrifices and washings and everything else in the Old Testament are fulfilled in Christ. And so when he says, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but I have come to fulfill them, that is indeed what he has done. So, when we look also, um, verses, uh, well, let me, let me read, uh, well, I'm just going to read all of it again, 17 through 19. <laughs> Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, this does not sound like a person who wants to abolish the law. He's saying, if you don't teach the law, then you are cursed. But you are blessed if you do teach the law and keep the law. So he's, again, he's getting after these slanderous accusations that have been made about him that he wants to abolish the law. That's not the case. He values the law greatly. Um, uh, and, uh, Paul mentions uh, the value of the law in uh, 2 Timothy 3 when he is uh, talking to Timothy and he says how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus and at this point there was no New Testament when Timothy was a child and so Paul is talking about the Old Testament and these these uh, sacred writings able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. He's talking about the Old Testament. And it's, it is of immense value. And of course, the, the verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This is as true for us today as we look at the law as it was for Timothy or for any of the Old Testament saints. Scripture is of immense value. The law and the prophets and the Psalms and the New Testament gospels and the letters and all of it. It is of immense value for us today and we should not think that we should just uh, pitch it. Um, I have had some uh, pastor friends uh, in uh, independent churches, not Orthodox, Presbyterian, or, you know, churches, but they have a disregard for the Old Testament, I'll say. It's, yes, it's God's Word, but now that we have the New Testament, it's of less value. It's really more for the Jews. It's not for us Christians. That is totally wrong. Um, especially, as we're seeing right here, you know, uh, with Timothy, you know, from childhood. You've been acquainted with these sacred writings. So, Jesus gives this warning uh, in verse 19, right? Whoever relaxes one of the least of these, um, whoever, but whoever does them and teaches them, this, this contrast between the two. And he's talking about, notice, the kingdom of heaven and reward in the kingdom of heaven. And it's not... Uh, you know, vague. Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments teaches others to do the same will called, be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of heaven, what the kingdom of heaven means, and so he's saying in the kingdom of heaven, the law is valuable. And the kingdom of heaven isn't, you know, the afterlife. The kingdom of heaven is here now jesus ushered it in okay so we are in as a part of the church we are in the kingdom of heaven the law has value for us uh, today how so 
how, how is the law valuable? Well, you've heard about the three uses of the law. We talk about this a lot. Um, we can uh, look at a few verses now. Uh, use one is a mirror. In Romans 7, 7, it says, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Okay, and as we look at the commandments the moral commandments in Scripture, we see a high bar for us to keep. And it is not possible. And as we consider what righteousness is, what God's expectations are for us, it is a mirror. You know, we look at our own selves and, and, and we have to say, I can't do that. I can't, I can't keep the law perfectly. The problem is, that's what the Pharisees believed. And they taught, do all these things externally, and you're perfect. And remember the rich young ruler who came and said, well, I've kept all those commandments from my youth. You know, what, what do I still lack? And so that was the teaching, that was the belief. You just do all these things externally, keep these things, you're saved, it's all great. Jesus is saying, no, that's not what the law is about. It's about the heart. And you guys have to realize that when you are exposed to the law, you have to come to the conclusion, I failed to keep it. And so it's a mirror. It makes us look at ourselves and our need for a Savior. The second use is protection. The law is protection for people in the world, just in general. Not even just believers, but everybody. You know, we have laws... Uh, in the United States and in the state of Florida and in Pinellas County, and these laws are for the protection of people. Uh, murder is illegal. You know, stealing is illegal. And these things, God has ordained the laws, uh, the morality that is in here, to be evident even in our civil organizations and governments so that his people and others are protected. There's order and not chaos like we have in Haiti where there's no government, just gangs running around doing whatever they want because they are mightier than the ones in their way. First <coughs> um, Timothy 1 Timothy 1.9 says, The law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and profane, and the passage goes on to talk about a bunch of uh, specific things that uh, the law is um, intended to curb and control and protect. Uh, the, the third use is delight uh, for the believer. Uh, listen to Psalm 19, verses 7 and 8. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And so as the believer is looking into the scriptures, we find it to be a delight. The law, even the commandments, uh, are a delight for us because we understand that this is God's will. And in our heart of hearts, we want to do God's will. We want to please him. We want to grow and become more like Christ. And so as we look into the word and see how it teaches us and molds our thoughts, molds our hearts, molds our desires, and we, we do, we become more like Christ. We become more holy. We become more different from the ways of the world. And it's a delight to us and a joy. And so those are, those are the three uses of the law. And they are of immense value to us today in the church, the kingdom of heaven. Now he ends this. Well, let, let me, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. All right, verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Now, this whole passage, Jesus is basically talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. And he's saying, you guys are slandering me, but you're the ones who have it wrong. You're the ones who don't know what's going on. 
okay? And he, he begins in the early verses saying, I haven't come to abolish, but to fulfill. He says, I value the scriptures so much that not even an iota or dot will pass. That's just like the smallest little letter, okay? Like a little a letter I with a little dot. Everything in the scriptures will, be, will not pass away uh, until all is accomplished. And then all these command, the, or what he, the warning he gives about relaxing the commandments, think about that from the perspective of the Pharisees. Hey, all of you guys who are relaxing a commandment and teaching others to do that and not keeping, but those of you who are keeping, there's reward, right? He's, he's targeting those Pharisees. You guys are not teaching it right. And then this last one, I tell you, your righteousness exceeds. Of course, there's the whole crowds of people he's talking to. Your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees or you can't enter the kingdom of heaven, right? The scribes and the Pharisees were, they were the holy people. They dedicated their lives to keeping the law externally. And Jesus is saying, you have to be more righteous than them, okay? And all the people are like thinking, how can I be more righteous than them? And the scribes and the Pharisees are like, you know, you're saying we can't enter the kingdom of heaven because we're not righteous enough. You know, he's really getting under their skin through this. And uh, we're going to see as we go through Matthew that there's a constant battle going on between the religious figures, uh, you know, and Jesus because they don't see things the way he does. So how much righteousness is enough? What is Jesus getting at here? Um, who, can, who can be perfect? And there's a couple of verses. Galatians 3.10 says, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. And in the context uh, uh, here in Galatians, Paul's talking to the church and he's saying, uh, you guys, if you guys are going to start trying to keep the Jewish laws and all the Jewish laws, then realize you have to keep all the Jewish laws if, you're, if you want to consider yourself to be righteous and holy uh, and if you don't you're cursed okay and then james 2 10 whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all so again it's the same kind of concept if you can't keep the entire law perfectly all of it every single bit then you have failed and this is what jesus is trying to get across to um everybody you can't keep the law you can't do it it's too hard and not only that but it's a heart issue and the next uh, several passages he he is begins interpreting for us the law in the way the scribes and pharisees don't like and he talks about what the law really means and he's getting he's getting this idea across that you cannot keep the law that's the whole that's the whole point right that's why we need a savior and he's preparing everybody now to listen to him explaining the law in the right way from a heart perspective so that they will understand that they cannot keep it that they need a savior just like we do and so who can be perfect only christ only Christ. And if we look again at that first verse under the spotless lamb in Romans 8, uh, 3 through 4, God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. The, t- in order to have this uh, life in the kingdom of heaven, we have to be perfect, but the flesh keeps us from doing it. God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. We, we couldn't do it, but God has done it. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. Jesus came in our likeness with flesh so that he could accomplish perfectly the law. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. There is a righteous requirement of the law that Christ was able to keep. And he fulfills that in us how well we are in christ with his burial and through that burial we become dead to sin 
And we are in Christ through his resurrection. And in his resurrection, we do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so it's through Christ and his perfectly keeping of the law that we find our union in him and membership in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is teaching here and preparing the hearers that there is more to the law than you have heard. The scribes and the Pharisees have got it wrong. Here's the truth. And then he goes on into the next passages. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, your word and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the ability he had uh, in his divine nature to keep the whole law perfectly for us. And we praise you that uh, you have brought us to his feet uh, to bow before him and express our faith in him so that we might die with him and live with him in this kingdom of heaven. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.